Thank you. Good afternoon. Let's set the stage for uh, some of the conversations we've been in over the past well, five years now uh, regarding what people have wanted around open notebook science from, from us as a, as a database, as you know, ChemSpider, Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, these are general conversations that we hear in almost every discussion, whether we're running a database or not. You sit around and have a glass of water in a, late in an evening, and these types of things come up. Chemists want access to tools and data, and the more capabilities, the better. What's the list? The more capabilities, the better. Okay. Who are you? Depends what you want, depends what type of science you're doing, but the more capabilities, the better. If we were to focus efforts on freeing up data, what would it look like? Well, the more data, the better. Well, what type of data would you like? More. More data. Okay. Uh, and give us an API with that, some fries, glass of water. It should be free. It should always be updated on a regular basis, and I shouldn't even have to worry about it. And all the data should be open. It should be fully open source, and it needs to be on my mobile. Those are kind of the conversations that we all hear, right? I see a lot of smiles in the audience, so I'm assuming you all hear this. So, the fact is that chemists have access to children data. There's lots of it. In fact, there's so many apps out there today that you probably can't even find them all. And there's so much data floating out there today. The question is, what's good, what's bad, how do you bring it together? Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about what we're doing. And the more capabilities, the better we'll see. Is it enough? Is it enough for the people in the room? Will it cater to everybody else outside the room? Who knows? The more data, the better. Well, that's changing daily. It changes on our site daily. It's changing what's out there in the ether daily, in the cloud of ether, of course. Uh, give us an API, yes, uh, we can give you APIs, and there's more than one. In fact, there's many of them. Some are hidden, some are not hidden. Some of them are being abused by countries that we won't mention. Uh, it should be free, sure. There's lots of things that are free, and we have lots of things that we're giving you for free. And we can give you more if you uh, want to use them, and I'll show you some of those things today. Constantly updated, yes, indeed. We, we constantly update what we provide, but we would actually like your help to update it, because you're almost certainly all sitting not necessarily right here in the room, but you're all sitting somewhere in your lab on data that would be better free. It would be better to make it available to people. So we're going to see if you want to do that. All data should be open. Welcome to the discussion about licensing and all the confusions that go with it. There's a paper that's just been accepted by PLOS, Computation Biology, by John Wilbanks, myself, Sean Aikens, that gives some recommendations around licensing. Uh, it should be out in the next week or so. And licensing is confusing. It's confusing for large projects and small projects. And depending on who you talk to, it's not going to get easier anytime soon. It's tough. Uh, and on our project, we've inherited data from 400 different data sources. So licensing is very, very mixed, heterogeneous, confusing. But we're going to try and solve that. Make it fully open source? Well, kind of, sort of. We've actually built our system on uh, Microsoft technologies. Uh, .NET, but we do have open source. Uh, Bob Hansen, brilliant JMOL that we have on the site. We have JSpecView. We have um, OpenBabel that we use. In fact, I've written a book chapter recently showing how RSC is using open source components. Some of Peter's components. We have a lot of open source running inside uh, our systems. And if you want to know the details, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the chapter. And it needs to be mobile. Sure, no problem. So most of you have heard me talk about ChemSpider. I won't belabor what's there now, but it's five years old. It's 28 million chemicals. I'm growing. It's 400 data sources. There's more stuff coming in all the time. It's hosted by RSC, and it is an important part of our long-term strategic vision. This is not just a little website of chemical data any longer. It's a long-term strategic vision aspect for us. Of course, free to access, and it's got lots, most, or all of the functionality that you need, depending on who you are and what you want. Um, and open notebook science is very important. It's important to me personally because I've known this guy for a long time. I used to run his NMR spectra when I was at Ottawa University, and I fully uh, align with his vision for what needs to be done. We've been building tools to support JC for a long, long time now, and I just want to do more here because I think we're just going to see this take over the world in the next few years. So why use ChemSpider? Uh, so if you do a search, you're going to find a chemical structure and some information. Uh, it's useful information. 
interestingly enough, a lot of people just stop here because they're looking for chemical compounds. I've given demos in the booth today and mostly a lot of people are using it just as a very, very big dictionary. They just want to find the molecule associated with a chemical name. And I would say 80% of users just use it for that. And then once in a while, they'll go further down. What's amazing is somebody who comes up to me and says, I'll be using it for three years. And I say, really? Can you tell me a little bit about it? And they know literally 10 to 15% of what's in the system. So let me show you what's in the system. Chemical names. It is an enormous dictionary. And this enormous dictionary has become more powerful in terms of how we integrate it to what's online. I'll show you some of that. We've been working on gathering data from various sources, and as you've seen from JC's talk, there are issues with these data sources. Uh, we are not curating it directly ourselves, but we are gathering data from people who are curating it. And I've personally sat for, I don't know, tens, maybe hundreds of hours at this point, and looked at chemicals and properties one at a time to try and figure this out. I'm sure you remember the long nights we've chatted about just one data point and things. This is expanding as more and more people are contributing data to us. And of course we have predicted data. And th these are all pre-predicted, so as compounds come in, this information gets predicted, put in the database, and is there for people to use. And of course, it's all about linking, so over there on the middle it says predicted chemaxon. Uh, one of the differences between these predictions is that they're all pre-predicted. So if the algorithms change, we're not going to change these values till the next time we run all those molecules through. And it takes weeks and weeks to run all of these calculations. A pKa calculation on a carbohydrate with 20 ionizable sites is not a fast calculation. Okay, so these are all pre-predicted. But algorithms change all the time. So we allow you to push the molecule right out to Chemaxon and they have the great chemicalized site. And they do these predictions in real time. They tweak their algorithms, you'll get a different answer tomorrow, potentially. Uh, spectral data. Uh, we've, been, we've been getting a lot of trouble, actually, because people expect 28 million chemicals that we've inherited from 400 data sources to all have NMR spectra, proton carbon, infrared, mass spec, positive ion, negative ion. So, well, wow, really? I can't even guarantee you that 28 million chemicals that we've inherited have ever been synthesized. I don't know that. Uh, so we've been getting a bit of a kicking over this. However, we're at 3,000 NMR spectra, 5,500 infrared spectra, and we're about to add a quarter of a million mass spectra. So this data, data set will be increasing shortly. And if you have a NMR spectra, infrared, mass spec sitting in your lab, please work with us. Um, I can deposit 1,000 spectra at the click of a button if I get them in folders. JCAMP and MALFILE, one button click, and they will just be deposited. Then there's articles, and we can all use Scholar uh, or any of the other services that we, that we commonly use to find articles. But of course, we're integrating you to multiple things. We have our own RSC journals that we do searches. And what we're doing now is we're taking the chemical compounds and all of the associated names, then we're hitting our own internal APIs in real time to pull back all instances of those names in those articles, priority rank ordered by where they're showing up in the journal article. That's the RSC Journals lookup. On the links and reference, that's where we've actually had MOL files, CDX files, come into the organization with the article, with the manuscript, and then we've published them directly. So they are different. And of course, we're doing the same with RSC Books, and we do it with PubMed, and we do it with Google Books using the Google API. But I'll show you something a little more fun with Google shortly. And then, of course, we have all the places that information is coming from, and we've done our best to segregate it according to the provider. So if they say we are a provider of information about metabolism, then we tag it as metabolism data, and you click on the metabolism tab, and that's what you have. Um, spectral data, natural products, etc. And then, uh, how many people here saw this announcement? I think it was last week from Google integrating to European patents now. That's kind of interesting. That's going to be rather disruptive to a few places. Um, we we uh, link directly to the Google Patents API um, using name lookup again. Uh, it works very quickly. Uh, we really like it. We also have all the integrations to show Ken. And then we have our own databases, mass spectrometry bulletin, lab hazards, methods in organic synthesis. Lab hazards, very useful if you want to know about certain chemicals and what hazards you may face with them. So that's just 
the molecules, the compounds. Uh, and there's more information there, but we'll hit some of it as I go forward. What about syntheses? Because one of the things we keep getting is, well, I want to know how to make that. I found it on your database, but how do I make it? That would have been a question you would have asked on one of your compounds. So we opened up a site for, for primarily for students, really, to publish syntheses uh, about how they make things, to practice, to practice the art of writing. I wish I had a platform to learn how to write before my PhD supervisor taught me with a ruler <laughs> and a pen in the eye once in a while. Because uh, I had nowhere to, nowhere to practice, really. So you, you learn by, uh, by fire. Um, what we found is, despite the fact that we had a favoritism, if you like, towards young, younger chemists to write up their syntheses here, we have a whole group of retired chemists who said, I can finally get my stuff out. So we have retired chemists coming and publishing their syntheses here. This is called uh, ChemSpider Synthetic Pages. We hoped it would be a great success. The reality of it is we're about five, six hundred reactions at this point. It's a nice platform to use. It's easy to write up on. You can put spectral data there. But this, um, this time of contribution that we're all in, supposedly, is mostly about us taking from the contributions of others, um, such as life. However, nevertheless, we do get some beautiful syntheses that are submitted. This is one of the steps to the Olympocene project. Those of you who know the Olympocene molecule look like the Olympic rings. Each stage was captured here on synthetic pages. And we do get about maybe between 8 and 12 submissions a month right now. It's not enough. However, that we have our own challenges with that. When I show this to people, people say, well, I didn't even know about it. So it doesn't help to get it used when people don't know it exists. But there's another way, and that is to just get reactions. And Daniel Lowe happened to have done some beautiful work, and he's working with Peter, for going through patent data and extracting reactions. So uh, those data have been made available to us, and we now have about 300,000 reactions. Uh, Chemspider.com slash reactions. It's very, very alpha. Uh, I can tell you now it's not a pretty interface. The flow is not what we want it to be but it is indicative, at least at this meeting, of where we're going. Um, so check it out. And we believe we will be inheriting even more hundreds of thousands of reactions in the next few months, especially because we're going to work through our own back file, our own archive of RSC articles and supplementary info files, and pull reactions out and put them all here and make them available. And of course, make it structure searchable and substructure searchable and linked out to ChemSpider and, and, and. So a nice direction for us. And there's some opportunities here because Jean-Claude is doing some great things with open notebook science reactions and you're reporting things in your wiki about how to do reactions. So wouldn't it be nice if these all showed up in one central place? We have a grand vision. I think everyone in the room would have this grand vision of you just go to the web and you say, find me this. And everything that is federated will come together in a beautiful interface and all is grand. Yes, not quite that easy. So we're saying for now, we're not asking you to transfer ownership over your data. We're not going to grab copyright to anything. But we're saying, look, we've got a platform here we'll host it in, and we'll make it integrated for you. We'll take on the load. We'll host the infrastructure. We'll carry the costs. Just offer us your data. A copy. It's still yours, and we will do something with it. So I think we have an opportunity here to, to talk about that. And then we link directly back to the wiki pages, etc., etc. And what if the links decay? What if all of those links that we build back to beautiful wiki pages just disappear tomorrow? What happens? Well, thanks to the benefits of openness, Jean-Claude would probably say, here's a copy, host a copy for us. And then we would say, great, now we need to set up an interface so that as you update on your side, we get a copy into our side. And then things really start to come together. And then reaction inchi. I'm assuming that people know that inchies are turning into reaction inchies. The work's already been done. Uh, Jonathan Goodman has been doing that in Cambridge. It's looking wonderful. So on 300,000 reactions, we will layer on rinches. We will, uh, we will test out the algorithms, we'll give feedback, and then we'll start to flow probably the largest rinchy collection um, into the internet. And maybe there's another one coming we don't know about. So over this glass of water late at night, um, these are the things we hear. We really want to grab as much data from you as possible. Go ahead, what would you like? Data, okay, what would you like? Take it, how would you like to grab it? Um, 
give us some web services. Done. There's a web services. Now integrate. And it's happened. And it's happening in so many places we don't even know. We get up, we get up to a million web service calls a day now. Um, some of those web services we have to close off because it just turns out that people are just trying to grab the entire record and clone it in other countries uh, and bring down our servers and get DNS attacks and things like that. So we're very cautious. But the web services are there. I'll show you some of them. You're welcome to them. Let us link, of course. The more you link to us, the better for us. We're trying to do the best for you. If you link into our systems, then we have traffic and we get usage and it allows us to show there's demand and then we can grow our team and we can grow our capabilities. Can we store our data with you? Yes, please. That would be great if you store your data with us. You don't have to give it to us, but if you store it with us, then we can do things with it, such as build models, such as work with Jean-Claude, ACD Labs, uh, Igor. We can provide data for people to develop models and then we can plug those models back in the system and then everyone wins. Can you give us predictions to validate data? Absolutely, that is feasible, and we'll talk about a couple of the approaches. And can you build us an ELN while you're at it? <laughs> well, ChemSpider Synthetic Pages is kind of a ELN for people working in reaction synthesis, kind of. It would have to be tweaked, it would have to be made into a single interface that works for everybody. That's not going to happen. So we have some, some issues if we were to try and build an ELN for you. But we can think about it. So how do you do simple linking? ChemSpider IDs are proliferating now. They're being used by lots of people. And boy, do I wish I'd put some dashes in it. <laughs> because numbers are, are uh, uh, that simple construction of numbers turns out to be problematic. But it is what it is for now. So a uh, nice, simple chemical structure. It's got a ChemSpider ID. All you do is throw it on the end of ChemSpider.com. And away you go. You have a link. Um, you'll, you'll find these things over in uh, Wikipedia. Um, mostly they are put there manually, uh, but we have built robot systems with people on Wikipedia so that they can go check. And that, those little green check marks basically mean a robot has been used and somebody has come along and checked it as the same molecule. Because there is no way from Wikipedia to push out a mol file to hit us because there's no mol files on Wikipedia. Okay, so wouldn't that be nice if there were more files? Well, it's right there. It's underneath the ChemSpider ID. You click and then you download it. Uh, here's an alternative. If you want to do a query rather than a link, then you'd hit us with an Inchi key, for example. I'm sure most of you know what Inchi keys are because we have standard Inchi keys across our entire database. And you would just run that query against us. And you can run it on Inchi itself instead of Inchi key. And you can run it on Smiles. And away we go. So simple querying, but there are, and that's what chemists would would generally do. Chemists don't want to think about integrating to APIs. They don't necessarily have the skills. And um, you're probably not building tools in chem informatics, right? You're you're a chemist. So, um, so people who want to use web APIs, we've given you various ways to go at that. And if you go under our web APIs uh, link, we will give you information and examples of Perl scripts and Java and Excel spreadsheet integrations and NIME endpoints and uh, .NET clients and Python wrappers and, 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 and. And we'll keep, we keep extending this based on who we talk to. If you need us to do something on our end to facilitate what you do, then once we built the example, we put it here and then it can get reused. And we've got lots of web services for integration. In fact, there's pages and pages and pages of services at this point. Not all of them are listed because we build them so quickly. Uh, we're part of the Open Facts project, Open Pharmacological Concept Triple Store. It's an enormous European project. It's going to generate a triple store of probably billions of triples by the end of the project. And we keep building new uh, layers onto this for that project. But most of what you would need is almost certainly here. If there's anything missing, just talk to us and we'll expand the list. Uh, assuming you have um, open notebook science data, you might want to feed it into ChemSpider. Because if you feed it in, then your data becomes more available to the public. It's integrated, it's available, there's, your profile can expand, and you get in traffic to your own site. So how do you do that? Well, a simple way is publish an SD file with some links, uh, which literally is put in the molecules, and there's a link over there on the right, ONS melting point nic nicotinamide. 
and you click and you go into the site sitting on the other edge of that link. It works, it's been working since day one. Um, the challenge is link decay, but that's it. That's what you find when you click on that link. That goes right into Jean-Claude's world. Um, if this page gets updated, if it's curated, if it's marked up, if it's annotated, that happens on, on his world. On our world, we just have a link. So one of the things that people get confused about is we are bringing together hundreds and hundreds of data sources and all the data. No, we're a hub. We're a centralized hub of chemical structures. We're linking information out primarily. Licensing of data needs to be clear. It's absolutely clear down on John Claude's page. Uh, and here we have the ONS solubility challenge with a link out to acetaminophen and that is pulling up the information right there on the ONS challenge. So right now I would say we're likely out of sync that we, ha I don't think you're depositing data as fast as you're generating it probably. Right. right. So one of the things about these systems is that collaboration and communication is what's necessary because we need to build systems that as soon as things are being generated on his side we need to pick them up and put them into the system so that it's not manual work. It would be great if data is generated and it just shows up. I have some suggestions about how to do it. I'm looking for somebody in the room to say let's chat, let's make it happen. So does that mean that Open Notebook Science is all about ELNs? That's what the last conversation was about, really, is I thought Open Notebook Science was about ELNs. So thank you for the uh, question. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, this is the definition that came off the Wikipedia page. I think it's the fair definition. Making records of research publicly available online as soon as it's recorded. As it is recorded, well, you're not, you're not doing exactly that, right? You could with an iPad, but those are more expensive than iPhones, so you're probably going to melt those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, depending on the temperature. Um, but of course, you're close, right? You're close. But ONS, of course, is enabled by software, by tools and platforms. So keeping the notebook of the researcher online with raw and processed data as it is generated, close to or near time. Uh, and notebooks are wikis or commercial ELNs or free ELNs published to the web. And one of the things that comes with this in the open facts world is you have to choose which data to make public what to keep private. There's no reason you can't use the same system and have a, a flag that's exposing some and keeping some private. So if that's what ONS is, in theory. Um, so feeding ELN data into ChemSpider. So why not integrate eNotebooks into ChemSpider? For example, why not have an eNotebook that says, I want the structure of erythromycin, and you don't have a dictionary integrated into your ELN, then hit our web service and pull it down. That's drawing on our web services and bringing stuff to you. That works, it's proven. However, we thought about it the other way. So now you're doing things in your ELN and we'd like you to share the data. So we worked with IDBS in their commercial ELN, uh, the University of Cambridge, so that you can actually push from the ELN directly up to ChemSpider. They, we developed an API that allows them to make calls to us and push the data in. There's an integration video here you don't have to write it down, I will put my slides on SlideShare later and you can just click on the link there if you want. But this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see it clearly. The published compound to ChemSpider. It might be unique chemistry, it may never have been seen before, it might not be in ChemSpider. It pushes it in, it carries information about where it came from, the lab that it came from, date stamped, time stamped. Uh, how much data is lost? So wouldn't it be nice if all of these reactions, oops, excuse me, all of the reactions as being here is not just about publishing the compound, but it publishes the reaction. What about if it publishes the spectra, etc.? So how many reactions in a thesis never get published? Uh, I know Peter's done work over the years going through and talking about how much data is just sitting there. I think you've been harvesting it, Peter? Uh, yes. Yep. How, and, not very much. <laughs> How, mu how much data do you imagine is lost in theses in a year? Uh, probably about a billion dollars worth. So we have a system that's cheaper <laughs> and free, but we don't have the content. We believe there's an opportunity to get theses scraped, content put in. But anybody can come along and add it at any time. How many, how many spectra get run in a day in universities around the world of just the most nominal compounds 
bought from Aldrich. It's not exactly proprietary, but we don't have them. We only have 3,000 NMR spectra. There's gazillions of these things that are getting run. And I know Bob's been doing some work with, with Bob Lancashire to take a look at this. How many properties measured and lost? How many properties not validated? What stands in the way of sharing it? It's not technology any longer. There is no reason to say there's a technology problem. I, I just don't believe it any longer. But we do run into this permissions issue. My boss says I can. Then there's a question of licensing and who does it belong to once it gets published. So I, don't, I just don't think it's technology. And yes, I would say there are data issues and quality issues and curation problems. But I say if you have good algorithms behind it, and I just showed you a pile of them, when data flows in, we get to validate. If you put an NMR spectra in, we can predict an NMR spectrum, compare them, validate it, and put it in with a quality factor that says 99%, this is exactly what you think it is. Same with melting points, same with boiling points. All of the data flowing into the system can be um, robotically, manually, uh, robotically curated and left for manual addition. So what could the future look like? All publicly funded research data flows onto the web. It would be nice if it flows into a place where it's all integrated and doesn't have to be federated with our grand vision, but at least uh, integrated at some level so you can search. It would be nice if licensing is clear and not a challenge. And Peter has done a job over the years of trying to convince people of the ways to license this data. It is becoming clearer, but it is still a very different conversation. And machines are picking up data. So this is the project I'd like to engage somebody in, if they're interested. Just if we can work with you so you put your spectra in JCAM format and your structures in a folder. Let's assume it's Dropbox. I knew you would. And then a, a, a robot, it could be the ChemSpider robot. If we want it on ChemSpider, it will be a ChemSpider robot. Just comes, scoops, processes, phases, integrates, validates, and puts it, uh, puts it onto the site. There's an opportunity I saw with you because you're already running these spectra and we could maybe just scrape them up and dump them on for you. There's no reason for you to have to do the work. And then while processing does this spectral comparison. Are you integrating to prediction engines yet? No, I don't think so. This far away is really the final stage. NMR Shift DB? Uh, NMR, is it NMR DB, NMR Shift DB? NMR Shift DB, excellent. All right, so I set the stage, and then I said, well, most of it's already being done. So leaving the stage, chemists do have access to lots of tools and data. And probably most of them don't know what's available. This room does, because you're interested in it. But you go out and ask most chemists, and they don't even know what's available. So more capabilities. What's missing? More data. What, who wants to share what? API, if you need a better API from us, if you're struggling to get what you need from us, just add, tell us what you need, please. It should be free, of course it is. Constantly updated, yes, and it gets updated more if you annotate and curate and tell us when you find problems. <coughs> Licensing will continue to be um, clarified. Fully open source, there's a book chapter on how, what we're using that's open source. It needs to be on mobile, it is. Alex is doing some phenomenal work in cutting edge development on mobile. Uh, we've got our own work going on in mobile. These are Alex's uh, screenshots from the ChemSpider mobile. We celebrated 10,000 downloads yesterday. It's going extremely well. We've got an Android version of Chem Goggles now that just came out. You take a photograph of a structure and it converts it with Osra, which is the open source code from NCI. These are new URLs for you to try out. This is ChemSpider Reactions. Uh, the one in the middle is going to become increasingly important. It's a, it's a structure validation and standardization platform. If we had services to provide to people where they take their compounds and they standardize under a standard set of rules, then most of these database linking issues are going to go away, in our opinion. So we're working with the FDA using their substance registry system rules to go through and implement uh, an open interface to all of those those rules to validate and standardize. They're also not perfect um, because they break every metal oxygen bond, which doesn't work very well for chromate and dichromate and permanganate because you kind of need those bonds. Um, so we are going to tweak them with them. All rules are going to be made available. All algorithms are going to be made available. It will be open, open, open as we can be with this system. Uh, there's a version up online for you to kick around. It's very immature, but it shows you where we're going. ChemSpider Google may be the thing that, um, that might be most fun to integrate to. If we could 
give you all of the things that Google have allow us to tap and you can tap it into your open notebook science systems it would be great uh, this just rolled out um, comes by to Google you come you convert a name or upload a structure and you click search and what we're doing in the background is we take that chemical, we look inside ChemSpider for, for the entire list of validated names, and then we hit the Web API for Google, the Patents API, the Books API, and the Images API, and search it on Google Scholar, and then we bring back the hit list. It's very fast, it seems to be working very, very well, and the reason we put this here is because while we've linked all of those things together under ChemSpider, the record is now this long, there's so many info boxes you don't know where to look. And when we talk to scientists, they say, I just search Google. Well, now you have a way to search Google by chemical structure. You just search it. Uh, of course, I'd like to say I'm clever enough to do this stuff uh, myself. I'm not a programmer. I used to be. I'm dangerous. Uh, we have a brilliant chem informatics team working in Cambridge and Washington. Um, it's been a joy to work with J.C. Bradley and students, uh, his entire lab on Open Notebook Science. Uh, I just hope we keep going. Uh, Daniel Lowe gave us access to the reaction set. Daniel is now at uh, Next Move Software. We use commercial software, uh, GGA, ACD Labs, OpenEye, and a whole series of open source components. Uh, we couldn't get done most of what we need to get done without open source. I hope it uh, set a vision for where we are as well as where we're going. And I welcome any questions, if I'm not over time.